This is Known Podcast, hosted by Dustin Bennett, the lead pastor of Known Victory Church in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. Known Podcast is dedicated to helping you grow closer to Jesus, unleashing the power of your creativity, and developing you as a leader. We hope you enjoy today's episode. Welcome back to the Known Podcast. So excited that you're joining us again today. And one thing to know about me is that I'm a huge sports fan, and I have been a sports fan for my entire life. You know, I grew up, and I played football, I played soccer, I played basketball, just love sports, but I also enjoy watching sports. And what's really funny is that all my favorite uh, sports teams are from different cities, right? So my favorite hockey team is the Edmonton Oilers right here from my hometown. Uh, and then my favorite CFL team, Canadian Football League team, is the Calgary Stampeders. My favorite baseball team is the Toronto Blue Jays. My favorite basketball team is the Denver Nuggets, but by far... My favorite sports team is the New England Patriots in the NFL. My favorite team. You know, the New England Patriots, they had this dynasty from 2001 to 2018. It's one of the greatest dynasties, in my opinion, maybe because I'm a fan of all time, right? You know, they won six championships over that span. You know, six championships under the leadership of Coach Bill Belichick and, and, and quarterback Tom Brady. And I got to see greatness happen every Sunday as they played their games, as they won games, they dominated and just kept winning championships. You know, and then when when Tom Brady retires, right, you know, this quarterback Tom Brady, probably, you know, the greatest, at least of this generation, he's going to go down, though, as one of the greatest football players of all time, maybe even one of the greatest athletes of all time, if not the greatest. There's a lot of debate on, you know, is he the greatest? But it's interesting because as humans, we love greatness, right? We love to look at something and see, wow, that is great. We like to look at somebody and say, wow, that person is great. And we see this, right, in, in art. You know, we see this in sport. Or we see this with painters, with writers, with poets, with athletes. We see greatness. And one thing that we like to do in our world is we like to argue about who's the greatest, right? Maybe you've heard this this before, the GOAT, right? The greatest of all time. We love to debate this. We love to figure out, okay, who was the greatest athlete, the greatest football player, the greatest singer, the greatest rapper, the greatest poet, the greatest artist that has ever lived? And we debate this. We argue, no, this guy's better. And it's because, you know, it's interesting because in our world, greatness is defined by results and performance. So, right, in sports, we define greatness by how many wins a player has, by how many wins a coach has, by how many championships they have, as well as how they their statistics compare to the other players around them, right? So we look at sport. We see, you know, Tom Brady, one of the greatest players of all time. We look at his championships. We look at his wins. We look at his statistics. We look at all that. We look and see, okay, he's probably the greatest of all time because he's proven it through, his, through results and through performance and great art if we look at art you know great art is determined by the technique that's used it's determined by the ability to see things you know in a new way and a, and a, like a new and a fresh way as well as the design of it you know the mind of thinking okay this is the design of this piece or this this poem whatever it is you know great employees are those who are maybe self-motivated, those who are productive, those who are punctual, those who are coachable, those who come in with a good attitude, right? Those are great employees. You know, great businesses, if you look at businesses, great businesses are those who have, you know, high profit margins, they have low turnover due to their work culture, and they find creative solutions to the problem they are trying to solve in the, and their customers feel cared for. That's what makes, you know, a great business. But not, not only... Do we, do, we, do we judge greatness this way, right? Not only do we judge greatness, I think all of us, we want to be great. I think all of us have this inner desire where we want to be great. And I can be real. I do. You know, I want to be great. I want to be a, a great husband. I want to be a great father. I want to be a great pastor. I want to be a great friend. I want to be a great follower of Jesus. That is my desire. I desire greatness. And I'm not going to deny that. And there are several moments, if we look through Scripture, where greatness is the topic of conversation, right? Greatest of all time. This, this topic of greatness is a conversation we've been having for a long time. And it's not different than when we look at the Scriptures. And it's, it's interesting because two times in the book of Luke, in the Gospels, in the Bible, 
uh, we see the disciples arguing about who is the greatest among them, right? Who's the greatest? You know, who among us has done the greatest things? Who among us has, has done the most beautiful things, right? They have this argument, and we can see this in Luke chapter 9, uh, verse 46, and this is what it says. Then the disciples began arguing about which of them was the greatest, right? They have this argument, who's the greatest? And this, this conversation between the disciples, right, it happened shortly after Jesus has sent them out into the world to, to bring healing, to bring food, to bring miracles into the world. And they return, and they start having this conversation, oh, who is the greatest? And I can imagine, right, the, the disciples, the boys, they're getting together like, yeah, I healed this kid. He was sick. He couldn't even walk. And then, and then all of a sudden, yeah, I said, pick up your mat. And he started walking in, and he was walking. Everyone was blown away because of this miracle that we see. And I can see another guy, you know, this other guy, you know, he was blind and I started praying for him and all of a sudden he could start to see shapes and then he started to see color and then he started to see the world for the first time in his life. The miracle was great. Look what we accomplished. Look at the miracles that we saw. And then Jesus, right, he, he, he knows they're having this argument. And this is what it says in verse 47. It says, but Jesus knew their thoughts. So he brought a little child to his side. Then he said to them, anyone who welcomes a little child like this on my behalf welcomes me. And anyone who welcomes me also welcomes my father who sent me. Whoever is the greatest, whoever is the least among you is the greatest. He's saying, if you want to be great, become the least. He's saying, if you want to be great, welcome this child. And it's interesting because at this time, children were known to have the lowest status. They had value. It's not that they didn't have value, but their status was very low, and they didn't have much of a voice. They didn't have much say in what's happening. You couldn't get anything from them. They didn't have anything to offer you. Being with them in some ways would have been a waste of time, right? Because they're not going to make you better. They're not going to make your business better. They're not going to add value to you. They're just kind of there. And, and Jesus is saying, if you welcome a child, if you are in the presence of a child, if you spend time with them, if you welcome them in, that's like welcoming me in. Whoever is the least among you is the greatest. Again, he, he's not saying that the child is great. That's not what he's saying. He's saying that if you are willing to humble yourself and become like the least of these, unless you are willing to be with the people who can't give you anything, they can't offer you anything, you will not be great. So they're arguing about who's the greatest, and Jesus is saying, yo, you're missing the point. The point is, are you willing to be with people? Are you willing to humble yourself? Are you willing to go to the lowest status to become the least so that you can push people forward, so you can push them up? Are you willing to do that? Because greatness in our world is defined by our results and our position. It's re it, greatness in our world is defined by our power and our position, our results, right? The statistics, what makes the greatest of all time? The world says statistics, it, it's results, it's position, it's your title that makes you great. But Jesus is saying here, and it's so different, he's saying the greatest in the kingdom is defined by how and who we serve. You know, the greatest in the kingdom is, is based on how we serve and how and who we serve. How we serve and who we serve. How are you serving the people around you? How are you serving? How are you loving? Are you willing to love? Are you willing to serve people who might be beneath you in status, who might be beneath you in position, might be beneath you in title? Are you willing to serve them? Or are you just taking advantage of them? Are you trying to say that they're going to make you better? Or are you saying, I'm going to make you better? That's what Jesus is saying. Greatness in the kingdom is defined by how and who we serve. If you want to truly be great, if you want to truly be great, it's about how well you love people, and it's about how well you serve them. How well are you loving the people that God has entrusted to you right now? How well are you serving the people that God has entrusted to you right now? And, and I have two things for us today that I think will help us redefine greatness and what it actually means and how we can actually become great in this world. And number one is this, true greatness is using your position to serve people. True greatness is using your position to serve people. What you have built, what you're going through, where you've maybe seen world greatness 
It's not just for you. You might have the position. You might have the title of CEO. You might have the title of pastor. You might have the title of dad. You might have the p- title of wife. You might have the title, but your title is not what makes you great. Our title means nothing. Your, your title is just there, but it's what you do with that title that makes you great. What are you doing with the titles you have in your life? Your title gives you closer access to people. We have the ability to hurt people or heal people. We have the ability with, with, with our title, with our position to hurt people or heal people. We will all hurt people, right? We do. We've, we are all will hurt people, absolutely. We will all say and do things that we regret that cause harm to someone. Yes, we will. Absolutely, we will. But the greatest people know how to apologize. The greatest people know how to not just run away when things get uncomfortable. To say, okay, you know what? I was wrong. You know what makes people great? When you can admit when you are wrong. When you can apologize for the things you've done, the things you've said that have caused people pain, that you've hurt people rather than healed people. We need to learn how to apologize to the people around us. I know it's so interesting. How many times have people in our world been so hurt by by other people they thought would be there because they had the title, right? It's people around us that we thought would be there. Maybe it was our pastor, our father, our mother, that we thought would be there. And we've been so hurt by them because it's not what we thought that they would do. They, They had the title, but they didn't live up to the responsibility. Do you know what's interesting? It's easier to become a father than it is to be a father. Okay, it's easier to become a father. You know, becoming a father is the easy part. Living the life of a father is very different. Living the life of a father is very different than becoming a father. You might have the title, but are you willing to live up to the responsibility that the title brings? We need to stop abusing our position, stop abusing our title, and actually use our title, use our position to serve the people. How many people have the title, but they're not willing to live up to the responsibility? You know, titles bring you more responsibility to serve and to give, right? They bring responsibility. You have the title. You have the position. we got to start using it for the right way. So the question that, that I think about and I think maybe we think about is how do I practically serve and give from my position? How do I practically serve the people God has entrusted to me? How do I give? How how do I do that from my position? How do I start serving people better? And I have three things that I think will help us. Number one is we have to find out who we lead. Who is it that you lead? It might be your family. It might be your friends. It might be your kids. It might be your spouse. It might be your, your, your employees. I don't know what your story is, but who do you lead? You have to figure out, okay, who do I lead? Who is it around me that I'm serving? Who is it around me that I'm leading, that I'm trying to lead through life? Who do you have around you? And you know, for you, it might not be this big, extravagant list. It might just be two or three people. And for others, it might be like hundreds, right? We Maybe we're running organizations or churches, and we have large amounts of people that we lead. We have to find out, okay, who is it that I am actually leading? And for me, when I look at my life right now, you know, I lead my family. I have, I lead my family, I, you know, my spouse, my, my kids, like we, we, we lead them. But I also lead my church. You know, I, I lead the, the, my, my congregation, the people in our church who, who come. You know, that I, my responsibility, my title as pastor, those are the people that God has entrusted to me. Who is it that you lead? Who is it? You have to actually figure it out. So that's number one, find out who you lead. Number two is get to know their needs desires and hobbies we have to actually get to know the people around us not just know their name but we should actually know their story we should actually know what makes them tick what 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 excites them what what it is about them that they do when they get home the things that they do for for exercise the things that they do for fun the things that their other hobbies what like do you know the people that you lead you might know their name but do you know their story do you know what they go through do you know what they need I think a lot of us, we, we don't actually know what people need because we don't ask. We don't ask the questions. We don't actually try and get to know people. You know, it, you might have a coworker that just had a child, right? They just had a kid. And, and rather than ask, hey, is there anything that you can need? You might just say, hey, I made some meals for you. 
me and my family, we cook some meals and we're going to drop them off. Let me know when's the best time. We're going to stop by. We're going to drop these meals off. We just want you to know that we love you. We care about you and that we're here for you. Here's some food. Now, it might be something super simple. You might know the need. Hey, they had a kid. What can you do about it? And I think a lot of us, we say, hey, you know, let us, let me know if you, if you need anything, right? Which is a great question. But at the same time, it's putting the ownership on them saying, okay, they have to now think, okay, I'm exhausted. I just had a kid. What do I need? I don't even know what I need. Like, I'm tired. Like, what do I need? And, you know, rather than saying, hey, I've made some meals for you. We dropped them off at your house. Enjoy. Enjoy this meal. You know, showing up and just and saying, hey, I know you need. I'm just going to bring you food is really, really important. You know, and, and for some of us, you, you might realize that you say your spouse, right, they love plants, right? Maybe they, they like to garden. They like to grow, you know, carrots or whatever in their garden. You might just show up one day and be like, hey, I know you love gardening and I love you, so I bought you some flowers to put in the garden. You know, I bought you a new thing to try in the garden. You might, to know people well enough to say, hey, I'm going to serve you by actually knowing what you might need, by knowing what you like, by knowing what you dislike, and actually providing for you the things that you actually need, not the things that I think you need. We have to actually get to know people. My wife, Beth, you know, she loves puzzles, and it puzzles me why, right? I don't, I don't get it. Like, I'm not a puzzle guy. I, I don't like puzzles. It's exhausting. It's a lot of work. Like, I just don't enjoy puzzles. But my wife, Beth, loves puzzles. She loves them. So I think, okay, every once in a while, you know what I'll do? I'll go to the store. I'll buy a puzzle. We'll put our daughter down to bed. I'll say, hey, I bought a puzzle for us. And we'll spend the night doing a puzzle. Because I know that's something she likes. I know it's something that, that she enjoys. And it's a way for us to actually be together. And so I know what she enjoys. I know what she likes. So I actually know how to say, okay, I'm going to serve you by saying, hey, let's get some time together. And we're going to do something that you love. I might not love it the same way. But I'm going to do it because I care about you. And I love you. And, I, and I'm going to lead you. And I'm going to love you. And we're just going to go forward. Do you know the people that God has entrusted you to lead? Do you know them well enough? And some of the best advice I ever got on becoming a parent was, was, this, was this advice that says this. If you want to be a good father, understand what your children love and learn to love it too. Understand what it is that your kids enjoy and learn to love it as well. You know, and this just doesn't work as a parent, but as a boss, like understand what your employees love and learn to love it too. Understand what your what your kids, your spouse, right, your your friends understand what they love and learn to love it too. That way, when you get together, you can have something in common to celebrate, something in common to do, right? And so we need to learn to love the things that we uh, love the things that the people that we lead love, right? We need to learn to love those things. And that might be hard, but get to know them. Don't just know their name. Know their story. Know what they, what they like. And then learn to love that too. And then number three is be available, right? Be available. My dad, you know, wise man, you know, my, my dad, he always used to tell me that love is spelt T-I-M-E, right? Love is spelt time. And so for him, you know, quality time was, was a way that, that he feels loved. You know, a moment where we can get together. You know, and as a kid, when I didn't have a lot of money, and you know, I just like write like a handwritten note, hey, Dad, Merry Christmas, and here is your gift. It's time, right? And so, you know, we'd, we'd spend time together. But, you know, one resource that we have is time, right? One resource that every single person on this planet have has the exact same amount of is time. Every day, we have the same amount of time, 24 hours every single day. What do you do with that 24 hours? For hours. Are you available to people when they need you? You know, it might be helping them move. You know, it might be being a shoulder to cry on when they're going through a moment of loss. It might be celebrating in them when they get the promotion. It might be sitting with them when they're excited about what's happening. It's sitting with them when things are hard. Are you available? Do you actually have time to take care of people? Do you have time in your busy schedule to serve and give? more of you to them? Do you have time in your schedule to serve them? You know, we serve people by being available to them in crisis and being available to them in celebration. Are you available to people when they're going through a crisis? And are you available to, with, for people when they're going through a celebration? Being available for people is not always comfortable. It's not always comfortable sitting with somebody in the doctor's office where they're getting a diagnosis. It's not a comfortable place to live to be. You know, it might not be comfortable, but it's so important. 
You know, we need to realize that that people need connection. People need us to be there in their hardest moments. And just because it's uncomfortable does not mean we can shy away from it. We have to be present with people. Are you available? You know, one issue that we face today in our society is this thought that hurry and busyness is success. So we think the people who are the most busy and who are always in a rush are the most successful people. That is not true. The most successful, the most powerful, the most great people are not always those who are the busiest, are not always those who are always in a hurry. Being in a hurry means you might accomplish a lot of tasks, but often the people around you get hurt because you don't have time for them, right? We might not have time for the people that we love the most. We might not have time for the people that we lead. We might not have time for them. Maybe we're accomplishing a lot at work or we're accomplishing a lot of tasks. But the most important piece is not the task, it's the people. It's the people. We get so caught up in this and people have to be more valuable than the product. The people we lead, the people we love, the people we serve have to be more valuable than the product. You know, I normally do my message prep for our church on Sunday. I usually do my, me- my message prep on Thursday morning, and I spend several hours, you know, getting my mind ready for what I'm going to speak about, and I, you know, write it all down and get it all set up. This is what I do Thursday morning, spend time in prayer, you know, preparation, and that's what I do, you know, Thursday morning. So that time for me is very valuable. Like, I don't like wasting that time. I don't like trying to schedule things in that time, because to me, that time is really important as I prepare for the product or the message, you know, for Sunday morning. I spend a lot of my time, you know, on Thursday preparing for Sunday, and then one time, Time, a man in our church came to me and he said, hey, I have a really important meeting Thursday morning. Uh, do you think you could come and just be there for me and support me as I, as I, as I go into this meeting? And it was a pretty in, intense and serious meeting. And, and I said, hey, no, I, I'm for, I can't. You know, unfortunately, I'm, I'm busy. Right? I, I got to do my message prep. I got a lot going on. I said, sorry, but I'll be praying for you, right? I'll be praying that that meeting goes well. And then I woke up, you know, Thursday morning. And, and I woke up and I realized this man is more important. Like this, this man's life, this person is more important than the product. If I care more about my message than the people, I have lost sight of the point. If I care more about my schedule or my timing than I care about being available for people, I have lost the point. And so I went to this meeting and I sat with him. I made myself available. I created time. I had to change my schedule. I had to switch when I did some things so that I way I could be present for him when he needed me. Your family is more important. Your people are more important than the product. The product is important. Yes, absolutely. But the people you're preparing the product for are more important. The people are why we do it. The people are so important and we have to invest in them. We have to be available for them even when it doesn't might not fit your schedule. And some of our schedules are so busy because you might gain success by being busy. You might gain success by being in a hurry. But you might look back and realize everything you lost to get there. You might be successful. You might have the success, you might have the position, you might have the title, but you might look back and realize, wow, look all the people I lost along the way. Look at all the friendships I lost along the way because I was trying to hustle, I was trying to be in a hurry, I was trying to to make something happen for me. You know, the people have to be more important. So that was number one, uh, which was true greatness is using your position to serve people. And then number two, and the last one is this, True greatness is using your power to elevate people. What makes someone powerful in our world? Right? We think about, okay, what are the most powerful people in the world and what do they have? Well, to be honest, it's really money, influence, and resource. Right? The people who have the most money are the most, are most powerful right? because they can make changes. They have the money to make changes. They have the money to, to buy things. Like they, they are influential. They have power. The people who have influence where, you know, they might have a large following and so they can actually influence a big number of people to go and do something. That's what makes people powerful. You know, the ability to meet the main needs of people is really what makes somebody powerful. It might be food, it might be water, it might be, you know, money, whatever. That's what makes people powerful. And we see people with power using it to take advantage of people. And it's so unfortunate. And it always breaks my heart when I see this. You know, we see, you know, some politicians using their power to build their own, their their, their own bank accounts or the ability to, you know, cr- go on these elaborate vacations. They're using people 
to try and make themselves better. We see so many athletes or musicians or artists who are living these promiscuous lives because they know that they can almost get away with anything they want. They have the money. They have the re- they have it all. They have everything that that people desire, and so they start doing things and saying things and going, you know, because they have all the power, they have the influence, they have the money, they have the resources, but they're using it in the wrong space. Power is important, but it's often misused. If you ever watch, you know, the movie Spider Man, if you you know a big like, comic book fan, but this movie Spider Man, Uncle Ben, which is Spider Man's uncle, this is what he says. He says, with great power comes great responsibility. When you have been given power, when you've been given, say, the position or the title or the money or the resource, when you've been given power, it brings great responsibility. You might have the power. You might have the influence. We have to use it to influence people in the right way. We have the ability to do it, and we get to decide which way we influence people to go. We all want to be great, but we have to use our greatness to influence people to be better. We have to use our power to elevate people, to make them better, to make them more valuable. Use your power to influence people to go the right way. The greatest people that have ever lived elevated other people they elevated people to be better the greatest people care about making other people better not just themselves do you care more about making your employees better than you make than you care about making even your company better do you care more about making your kids better adding value to elevate your kids to be better do you do that and leadership guru right this guy who's written so many leadership books maybe more than anyone on the planet John Maxwell maybe you've heard of you know John Maxwell this is he has this quote and this is what it says it says success is when i add value to myself but significance is when i add value to others Right? Success is when I add value to myself. I think a lot of the time we're going through our life, we're hustling, we're hurrying, we're busy, trying to make ourselves more valuable, right? To make our minds or our companies more valuable, makes us better. That's success. But there's a big difference between success and significance. He says significance is when I add value to others. How many people are so successful, but they feel life is meaningless? We see this, again, we see this in celebrities. We see this in actors and musicians and athletes. How many times do they have the houses, they have the cars, they have the money, but what they realize is there's no significance. Uh, There's no purpose. There's nothing that's building other people. It's just making me better. I'm trying to build myself. Significance comes when we invest in other people to make them more valuable. Success is when we try and make ourselves more valuable. What we do has to have significance. It has to have purpose. It has to have vision. The greatest people that changed the world made other people better, not just themselves. Let us live our lives dedicated to making others better, to adding value to people. Let's dedicate our lives to making other people better. You want to be truly great? Make other people great, right? Use what you have, your power, position, your title to make other people great. That is when we're going to find significance. That's when we're going to find purpose. That's when we're going to find greatness. When we see other people going farther, when we see other people getting better, that's what greatness is. You know, and John Maxwell, again, he, he teaches that every follower is asking three questions about their leader. Three questions. Every, every follower, every single person is asking three questions about their leader. And these are how we gauge the value we are adding to people. Num- question number one is this. Can my leader help me? Do you genuinely desire to help your people to grow and to learn and to succeed? Do you genuinely desire to help people? That's a question that our followers, our families, our kids, our employees, our bosses, they're asking this. Can you help me? And so for us, we have to actually know what people need in order to actually be there to help them. Do 
Can my leader help me? And the number two is this. Does my leader show care for me? Do you genuinely care for the people on your team? Do you offer that care in a way that is meaningful to them? Again, we have to know our people. Do, does my leader show care for me? Do you care about your employees? Do you care about your spouse? Do you care about your kids? Do you care? That's what people are asking. They're asking, do you care about me? And then are you actually doing, uh, showing that care, offering that care in a meaningful way to them? So that's what we need to do. If we want to add value to people, again, number one, are you helping the people you're leading? Number two, do you care about the people you're leading? And then number three is this, can I trust my leader? Do you manipulate the people on your team to further your agenda? Or do you motivate the people on your team to benefit them? You know, our motivation for people has to be more about them than it is to me. It has to be more about elevating our team or elevating our family or elevating them to be better, to, to do things bigger, to make them great. Again, the three questions. Number one, can my leader help me? Does my leader care about me? And then can I trust them? It might be time for us to dive deep into these questions and understand if they can or they cannot. You know, and it might be painful. It might, it might be painful when you realize, yeah, my, my employees, my, my spouse, my kids, they don't feel like I care about them. They don't feel like I care about their needs. They don't feel like I care about their desires. They don't feel like I care. It might be time for us to not just self-diagnose, to, to look at ourselves and figure it out. It might be asked, wise to ask somebody else to come and say, hey, maybe to your spouse and say, hey, do you, do you trust me? Do you, do you think that I care about you? Do you think that I'm helping you? Those are some questions that I think we need to ask, and it's going to give us a really good baseline of where we are right now when it comes to our greatness, when it comes to the value that we are adding to people. It might be heartbreaking when you realize the results. But allow people into these questions again. Ask your spouse, ask your kids, ask your employees, and allow them to be honest. And if your employees, if you're the people you lead cannot be honest, it might be because they don't trust you. It might be because they don't actually trust you to respond in the right way. They don't trust you. And so we need to dive deep into these questions to realize, okay, how much value am I actually adding to the people around me? How much value am I adding to them? That's what makes you great is when we can lower ourselves so that we can get underneath people and push them forward, push them up. And later on in the book of Luke, Luke chapter 22, the same question gets posed. We can read this, Luke 22, 24. It says, then they began to argue among themselves about who would be the greatest among them. And Jesus told them, in this world, the kings and great men lord it over the people, yet they are called friends of the people. But among you, it will be different. Those who are the greatest among you should take the lowest rank and the leader should be like a servant. Who is more important, the one who sits at the table or the one who serves? The one who sits at the table, of course, but not here, for I am among you as one who serves. Jesus is the greatest example of greatness in human history. Jesus, the greatest example of greatness. Jesus, God, coming from perfection, to our broken world, right? Coming from perfection down to a broken world to serve us, to elevate us, to change us, to save us. The one who deserved a royal entrance, the one who deserved the feast, the one who, who came to, to he, he deserved it all, but he came and washed our feet. He heals our bodies and he died instead of us. This is Jesus, the greatest example of greatness in human history. Jesus had the title of God, yet chose to walk in the responsibility of a servant. What a thought, right? Jesus had the title of God, but he chose to walk in the responsibility of a servant, willing to come and serve, to wash our feet, to feed the hungry, to clothe the naked. That's the God, that's Jesus, the greatest example of greatness Jesus serves us, he wants us, he loves us, he elevates us, he saves us. Jesus, he is the definition of greatness. 
His influence and power are used to make us better and make our world better. Jesus. You want to enter the conversation of the greatest? You want to become great? Learn to be more like him. Learn to be more like Jesus. Learn that your title, learn that your position should be used to serve people. Your title doesn't make you great, right? Your title is not what makes you great. What makes you great is what you do with that title. What do you do with that position? That's what makes you great. And we need to learn that your our power should be used to elevate people, to add value to them and not take value from them, to build ourselves, but to make them better. It's not about making us better. It's about making them better because selfishness destroys greatness. Selfishness destroys greatness. We can be great by serving people well and elevating people above ourselves. That's what makes us great. We can all learn to be great. We can all learn to enter the conversation. Who's the greatest? It's about who you serve and how you serve. It's about who you serve and how you serve. God has entrusted people into our life. And our responsibility is to serve them and elevate them. To, to, to meet their needs as well as to make them better. We can do this together. We can do this as a family. We can do this. Thank you for joining us today for The Known Podcast. We have new content coming out every Wednesday, so make sure to come back next week for a new episode. If you haven't yet, make sure to follow us on Instagram at Known Podcast and follow us on your favorite podcast platform. See you next week.